today as we come to the table. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? Now, there are some relationships that are already in that. Maybe one spouse gets saved and the other one doesn't, and you can't help that. Now it's a matter of waiting on God in prayer. But when we're entering into marriage and we have control of that situation, the Bible says, do not get married to an unbeliever. No, don't even date them. Do not be yoked together. And again, the yoking was that side of the yoke they would put on the animals when they use them to work in the fields because you're linking them together. And if they were animals of different types, they would pull different directions. Are you tired of constantly feeling like you're compromising your faith in your relationships? Do you feel like your current relationship is pulling you away from God? In today's message, Pastor Mark talks about how as Christians, we're called to be equally yoked with our partners, which means we should date Christians. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. Dating a non-believer can lead to challenges and temptations that can ultimately pull us away from God. You might find yourself in situations where you feel like you have to compromise your faith to keep your partner happy. That's why God calls us to have relationships with believers so that you can build each other up in faith. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Genesis chapter 24 with today's edition of Come to the Table. Genesis 24, In Search of a Bride. Uh, Genesis 24, the longest chapter uh, in the book of Genesis, and uh, a tremendous, tremendous love story. Why don't we pray? Let's ask the Lord's blessing, and then we'll get into this and just enjoy what God has for us today. Father, how we thank you, how we look forward to what you have for us today. Lord, as we look today at the love that you had, and Lord, that you developed between Isaac and Rebekah, Lord, let it be a love story to our heart and the love that you have for your bride, the church. For your word tells us that indeed we are your bride. And Lord, the love story is one of earthly nature, but it's also one of heavenly nature and heavenly design. And so I pray, God, we would exchange that love and we would hear your spirit speaking your love to our heart. Lord, open your word to us and teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, some of the greatest love stories in Throughout time, you might think of, we're in a book or maybe in a movie, but I'll tell you, I think after studying Isaiah chapter 24, this is one of the greatest love stories I've ever read, and how it would be awesome to have all the details of what happened that we don't have. If there were a novel written on the life of Isaac and Rebecca, I'm sure it would be a top seller. This chapter is tremendous, and to see God's hand in this, not just the love that we see that is brought together and developed with these two, but to see the story unfold as God joins these two together in, in marriage. And so this story comes with great intrigue, great romance, as we see a father seeking a bride for his son. So it has all the elements of just a, a thrilling story to the heart, and indeed it is. Now, again, as we get into this today, we have to understand that marriage in that day was very different than it is in our day. Back in that day and in that culture, your father, for the most part, picked out your spouse for you. And that might be something that some of you have great fear in your heart now, or actually great rejoicing that it's not that way today. You know, I think it would be neat if indeed the parents did do that. I'll tell you what, it would make our children children of prayer. I mean, you'd be surprised. You know, 11, 12 years old, they're fasting. And, you know, and they're, oh, God, please. You know, honey, you need to eat. No, 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 I'm, I'm fasting longer. You know, you're picking my bride, you know. And so I joke when I say that. But you know what? God designed this for a reason. I think God put this into that culture and put that into the Jewish culture to give us a picture of something that God really wants for us. And that is this. It is best for us to allow the Father to pick the one that we're to be joined with. And that is for us as believers today, the picture is the Father in heaven. 
Yes, it was a very visible earthly picture in that day, but you know, it is wisdom to seek the Lord for the one that we are to spend our lifetime with. And you know, the reason that the parents would pick is they said, you know what, our children are way too immature at the marrying age to really be able to pick out a lifelong partner. And how much better for us to say to the Lord the same thing, God, you know what? I see things one way and I see things my way, but I don't have the years of maturity and I can't see the longevity that you can. Father, you be the one that picks out my bride. And truly, as, as, you know, as you've heard, Father knows best. In this case, that is exactly the truth. And so I do believe that we need to allow God to pick out the one that we're married to. And now, again, if you're not married, that's something you need to be doing. But if you are already married, then we're going to give you great hope and great encouragement today in what God can do in your marriage, no matter what kind of marriage it is. And that is God knows how to revive a marriage and make that marriage itself, if you will, be born again if we simply follow the instructions that God has given us. But how much better for us to... Again, to trust in the Lord and to just wait on God to uh, bring us the one that he has for us. And we'll see that in this story today in a very literal way, but also in a very picturesque way of the Father in heaven. Now, I can say every father and mother at some point begins to think about the day their children will be married. Now, a lot of times it's later on when they start getting in marrying age. But I want to encourage you as a mom and dad, begin to think about your children in marriage now. Now, I know that can bring thoughts of sadness because you think, you know, hey, one day they're going to be gone. Some of you might be thinking, hey, that brings thoughts of gladness. One day they'll be gone, but I'm just kidding. It goes both ways. But the bottom line is, is that we need to be praying for our children. We need to be, and I pray for the girls right now. I pray for their husbands. I pray for their wives. Their wives. I pray for the girls as wives for the husbands. So I pray for them too. I say, you know, Lord, they're going to get one of these girls. Lord, have mercy on them. But <laughs> I'm just kidding. Our girls are just a joke. It's a joke. But either way, we need to pray for God to have mercy on our children and the spouses they're going to end up having. And so it's a good thing to start out as parents doing that because I do believe that God wants us to be a very integral part in who our children join up with in marriage. And that is we specifically don't go and pick them out. But you know what? We can pick out our children's spouse today through prayer before they ever come along. Because as we're lifting up to the Lord and saying, God, I want you to bring the perfect one for them, we are in essence picking out their spouse. But by the time that one shows up, they think they did it. Isn't that a great kind of thing? And yet at the same time, I think it's, it's so important for us to be really involved in that. Well, that's the story we see today. Abraham now, well advanced in years, 140 years old, and now seeking a bride for his son, Isaac. Notice verse 1, Abraham was old and well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had, Please put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac. Now, first of all, notice this. It's Abraham's oldest servant that he sends on this journey. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us who this is. I'll tell you later on why I believe it doesn't tell us. But again, we, most scholars agree, and I think that they're right on. We can pretty much be sure this is none other than Eliezer of Damascus. Now, why do we say that? Because Eliezer, back in Genesis chapter 15, was shown to be the steward of Abraham's household. He was shown to be the one overseeing his house. And typically, when you had a large household like Abraham had, literally hundreds of people, you would have an overseer and a steward. And again, you would have people assigned to different duties. And Eliezer had been a proven, trusted servant. And now when you had something very important, like seeking out a bride for your son, you would send your most trusted servant, the oldest servant on the journey. And so no doubt this was Eliezer of Damascus. And notice he asked him to put his hand under his thigh for this oath. Now, why would he do such a thing? That sounds rather bizarre. You know, my girls have the promises they make, you know, the pinky promise, and that one's pretty heavy. It's almost legally binding, I think. <laughs> but at the same time, this was even a greater promise that they had to make, putting the hand under the thigh. And again, what it represented was, just to be very blunt, putting your hand near the area of procreation, saying, not only am I going to keep my oath to you, but I'll keep my oath to your generations after you. And so this was a heavy oath to take. It's not something you took lightly. You were responsible not only to the person you were promising, but to all of their children and descendants after them. And if you broke that, you broke the honor of the entire family. So understand in this day how heavy this oath was when he did this. And next, notice what he says. He says, make sure that you do not take a bride from here, from the land of Canaan. 
but take one from among my people, from my country. Now, this is significant. Why his country? Because God had now called Abraham to a new country. Remember, God said, leave the country you're in. That is the country of sin. That is the country of false gods. That is the country of a godless people. And come to a new place, I will show you, in essence, in type, saying, my country is, country is the country of God. And I don't want you taking someone from the world for my child. I want you taking someone who is from God. I want someone who is from my country, someone who knows the things of God and knows about God. That is, I want a believer for my child would be a more modern way to say this. They were surrounded by wickedness. They were surrounded by unbelievers in Canaan. Others did not know the God of Abraham. Abraham had shared with this family. His family now knew about the God of Abraham and he wanted someone who knew about the God of Abraham. He wanted a, a bride or a husband, and we can look at it either way in this case. His was a bride, but for moms and dads today, we want a bride or a husband that is from the country of the believer. It's interesting. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says this, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? Now, there are some relationships that are already in that. Maybe one spouse gets saved, and the other one doesn't, and you can't help that. Now, it's a matter of waiting on God in prayer. But when we're entering into marriage, and we have control of that situation, the Bible says, do not get married to an unbeliever. No, don't even date them. Do not be yoked together. And again, the yoking was that side of the yoke they would put on the animals when they use them to work in the fields because you're linking them together and if they were animals of different types they would pull different directions and when you are a child of God you are pulling a different direction than those who are not children of God you are now living in light they are living in darkness they've not yet been born again their eyes have not yet been opened and so God says in his word make sure that you don't do that and moms and dads I believe when it comes to our kids one of the first things we need to do if they have any interest at all is is this person a believer and let me say this for the ladies, as the man is called to be the leader of the household, I think you need to be looking for someone who's going to be dragging you to church. Not that you have to beg to go, because they're supposed to one day be the leader. Now, they're not the leader now, but again, this whole model should be in place if it's the right person and God is bringing this together. Now, Notice it goes on here. He says, don't get a, a bride from here. Go and get one from my land, verse 5. And the servant said to him, perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me to this land. I mean, this was, a, think about it. You're going to some land hundreds of miles away, 450 to 500 miles away and saying, come back and marry a guy you've never met. He's saying, what if she says, you know, she's not going to come back. Must I take your son back to the land from which you came? In other words, maybe I should take him back and kind of let her see, you know, the merchandise before they make this deal, right? And, and notice what he says here. It's interesting. He says, but Abraham said to him, beware that you do not take my son back there. Again, notice the sense of, I believe a sense of urgency. We can't hear the inflection of his voice, but the wording, beware. Don't dare take him back there. Why? Because listen, the same reason I want a godly woman for my, for my son, I don't want my son going back into a place where he could end up settling that's out of the will of God. That's the land God called me out of. Why would I want my child going back there? And the same thing is true for us when it comes to our children in marriage. God has called us out of the world and into a life of righteousness and of God. Why do we want to let our kids go back and date and get intermingled in the things of the world in the land that God brought us out of? By no means. Do not let them go there. Uh, you, bring, you make sure that she comes here and that's going to be the way it has to be. The Lord God of heaven who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family... And who spoke to me, swore to me, saying, to your descendants I give this land. In other words, this is a new thing in God, not the old. It's passed away. He will send his angel before you. And you shall take a wife for my son from there. So God will be with you, in other words. And if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be released from this oath. Only do not take my son back there. And now he answers the question that Eliezer had. And that is, he's like, what if she won't come? I'm taking this, you know, oath here that's heavy. And you, what if she says no? He says, no, I'm going to release you from that. If she says no, then that's in God's hands. But I'm going to trust in God to lead you to the one that's supposed to be there. And then she'll come back if she's supposed to be of the Lord. And again, that's exactly what we should be doing is trusting in the Lord to lead us to the one that we're supposed to have. Not leaving it up to luck, not leaving it up to just dating, but trusting in the Lord to take us to the one that he has designed for us to have. Now, I love this because, again, what a beautiful picture of the gospel this is. He says, what if I say, hey, the son needs a bride, even as we are the bride of Christ, and she says, no, I won't come. He says, then you're released. You, you can't make her come. 
And that should really be our understanding when it comes to witnessing. We are to go to those and to make them the offer. The father is calling you to be a, a bride for his son. Will you receive? And she says, no, don't give me that Jesus stuff. You're freed. You, know, you can't convince them. You can't fight with them. I used to try to do that, but it doesn't work. Just simply put the gospel out there and let God work in the heart. And that gives us great rest in our heart, knowing that we're not the one that does the saving anyway. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham. Now that he knows all the details, he, re- he, he agrees to this heavy contract uh, with his master Abraham. And he swore to him concerning the matter. So then the servant took uh, ten of his master's camels and departed, for all of his master's goods were in his hand. Again, that's how it would be for the steward. And he rose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. And he made his camels kneel down outside the city by a well of water. Note that at evening time and the time when the women go out to draw water. Now, why by a well? Well, understand it was common in that day for the women to go out to get water for the family. So this was the logical place for Eleazar to stop and to look for a bride. The women would typically go twice a day. They would go in the morning. Again, the husband would be out working. And the women would go in the morning. They would get water that they would need for their cooking and their washing and their drinking. And then they would go back in the evening and get what they needed for the rest of the night to make it through until the next morning. Well, he knowing this being the tradition of the day, what a great place to settle down. It was obviously a place where he would see the women come out. But you got to remember, there was another reason that Eleazar wanted to be by, by water. And that was, he was going fishing. Eleazar was looking for a bride. And he was trying to hook one. He said, hey, if I'm going to find one, this is where they're going to be. And so now we see Eleazar again, gathering here by the well and waiting to see what God's going to do. And notice he said, O Lord of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, here I stand by the well of water and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, drink, and I will also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one that you've appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. I'll bet what a prayer that was. Now again, notice, I want to say this before we get into that. Notice Eleazar begins his search for a bride with prayer. This is where every search for a bride should begin. Not just us as we wait on God to bring us the one we're to be joined to, but mom and dad. We need to be praying for our kids, as we already mentioned. And then the kids need to be praying. And we all pray together, you know, praying about who they're going to be and what they're going to be and for God to bring the right one along and to be, you know, praying for them. God already sees who it is. And what I love about Eleazar is he's doing it the right way. This is how it should be done when we're joining in marriage. And that is it should begin in prayer. And so again, he, he's crying out to God saying, God, you've got to lead me in this. And secondly, we should be looking in the right place for a spouse. How many people go out and look in the clubs or look on, you know, whatever, you know, uh, the internet, you know, and search out whatever they can try to find to find somebody, this kind of thing. And I know there's been some successful marriages on the, I understand that. I know that's happened through the internet options and all that kind of stuff. But I really think instead of eHarmony.com, it should be his harmony, be calm. And waiting on the Lord in prayer, I think that's really how we should approach it. Because I think when we take things in our own hands and set out, it's not always going to end up the way that it should end up. But God knows who is going to be the one for us and who's the right one. And notice where he was looking. He was looking at a place where it was common again for the unmarried daughters. The mothers would send the unmarried virgin daughters out in the morning to gather the water and to bring it back. And again, it wasn't always, you know, the, the daughters, but for the most part, culturally, they would go and do that. And so he knew by this well, he was going to find someone who was available, who was, who was someone that was pure and was, and was waiting for a husband. And so again, this was a great place to do his fishing, so to speak. But again, now notice how specific his prayer was. And, and, and again, I think it's good to be specific in prayer because he wanted to make sure that he had the right one. Now, again, I'm not, when I talk about being specific in prayer, I think we need to be praying very specifically for, for the, you know, the, the type of bride or, or husband that we want. But now don't make the list to be unrealistic. Sometimes I hear people talk about, you know, they have to look this way, they have to be that, whatever, and the guy, you know, all these different things that they list that they have. But understand, if you're creating this high standard for this one that you want, they're going to have just as high standard, and you've got to remember, they're going to get you. And so you've got to be, you've got to realize, hey, it's going to be sometimes maybe as much out of your league as it is theirs. And so there's nothing wrong in praying for specifically what you want, but you need to be that as well, you know? And so again, we see him being very specific here though. And he says, Lord, you know, let her not only say, let me give you a drink, but let her say, 
get my camels a drink. I'll get your camels a drink. Now, why would this be such an amazing and bold prayer and very specific uh, to find the kind of woman that he was looking for? Well, it's, anybody can give a drink of water. You know, drink of water, that's easy. But camels, these guys drink water. It's been said they can drink after a, a desert journey 250 to 300 gallons apiece. And there were 10 of them. This is one girl, one pitcher, and one guy praying, God, let her offer to water the camels. Now, this would be, if, you know, it'd be one thing to say, here's a drink, and look at the camels and go, good day. You know, I mean, to walk <laughs> off. But the kind of woman who would look at the camels and go, can I get your camels a drink? This is a woman of character. This is a woman of depth. This is a woman of quality. This is a woman of servanthood, whom indeed he would be looking for as a bride for his master. Because remember, Isaac was inheriting quite the inheritance. Hundreds of servants, large family. This would need to be a woman who was diligent. This would need to be a woman who was a servant. This would need to be a woman who not only was diligent and a servant, but this would need to be a woman who was willing to do it with the right heart and the right attitude. And notice here in verse 15 what it says. He, after he, he prays this prayer, it says, And it happened before he had finished speaking that, Behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. I love this. Notice before he was done even praying, God sent Rebekah. And I love those kind of prayers being answered. In Isaiah 65, 24, it says that God hears us even before we pray and answers before we even speak. Now, that's exciting to me because I know sometimes we wait forever, don't we, for a prayer. And yet when it's God's timing, God will move. This was God's timing. And so now we see this. She comes walking up and again immediately no doubt grabbed his attention. Because notice verse 16, the young woman was very beautiful to behold. No doubt he wanted to look for a beautiful woman, you know, to please Isaac. And he says she was a virgin and no man had known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and she came up. And the servant ran out to meet her and said, please, let me drink a little water from your pitcher. Again, he's starting this test now. The thing he'd prayed for, is this, is you, you answering God? So she said, drink, my Lord. And then she quickly let her pitcher down to her hand and she gave him a drink. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. Now, bingo. Now, this is where the verse is left out in the Bible that says that, that Eleazar turned around, pulled his fist down and said, yes. See, because now he knew this. Listen, this is no ordinary girl. How many girls are going to offer to, to, to load hours worth of water, 250 to 300 gallons for, for, you know, 10 camels? This is a woman of character. This is a woman of quality. This is a woman of servanthood. This is a woman who is selfless and looking out for others. This is the type that my master needs. And again, that would be the one to carry on the heritage that God had promised by the, the promise of Abraham to the Jewish people and the coming Messiah. This would be, if you will, one of the mothers of the Messiah. And again, so the quality of woman that he was looking for. And so this was a beautiful thing that's happening here. And again, you know his heart's leaping out of his chest at this point because the exact prayer he said happened. And when she had finished giving him a drink, Oh, I'm sorry, verse 20. Then she quickly, notice this. Then she quickly emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran back to the well of water to draw for his camels. Notice she was not only willing to serve, but she was willing to serve quickly and with a good heart. Isn't it interesting that it only took a couple of chapters in after God created everything for mankind to find a way to rebel? This is human nature, isn't it? Throughout history, God has something great in mind, but people find loopholes and do things their own way, rebelling against God. Something that's striking in the book of Genesis is that God remains faithful even when mankind does not. God keeps his promises when it would be impossible for anyone else to do so. What an amazing God we serve. Pastor Mark has been working his way through the opening book of the Bible, and there's so much more to gain from it. Come to the Table is a radio ministry of Calvary Knoxville. If you're enjoying these teachings, head over to thewaymedia.net to hear more. Just click on the Come to the Table tab while you're there. If you have any questions or comments about today's message, we'd love to hear them. Just look for the questions and comments link. If you're ever in the Knoxville, Tennessee area, we'd love for you to drop in and see us. You can find service times and locations on thewaymedia.net. 
scroll to the bottom of the page and find a link to Calvary Knoxville. We have several service times that could accommodate whatever type of schedule you have. We're so thankful that you've joined us today, listening to Pastor Mark's thoughts and insights on the book of Genesis. There's more to learn and appreciate from the beginning of the Bible on. So come next time, grab your Bible, maybe a cup of coffee, and be ready to understand the great things God has for you to learn the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.